Yo, it's Amanda Dodd and she's kinda odd, but hey, she's totally Amanda. Hi guys, welcome back to a new video. Today's video is going to be different than any video I've done before on my channel. It's gonna be a serious one, but a very real and informative one. The main reason that I wanna make this video is because I'm an open book. I don't usually put my stuff out online, but I do consider myself to be very open and I have no problem speaking on these things. And I also just think it's important to share your knowledge if you have something that can benefit other people. Even if this video just helps one person, I think that that's great. Maybe makes some of you feel less alone in what you're going through. I guess I should just start at the beginning of my journey with all of this and it was early 2019 when I got genetic testing done. I believe that I was 29 at the time that I got this done and that's a good age to start this process even earlier if you can. My doctors were actually urging me for a few years to get this testing done because cancer is definitely a part of my family's history. If your family also has a history of cancer, then I strongly urge you to get these tests done, but I actually think it's important to do it even if you don't have a family history. Just because you don't have a family history doesn't mean that you don't have this. So what is this? Well, unfortunately, I have the BRCA1 gene mutation. It honestly wasn't too much of a shock to me that I have it because like I said, I do have a very long history of it in my family. Really quick, just to give you guys an idea of my family history, both of my grandmothers um, had cancer. My grandfather on my dad's side had cancer. Um, a second cousin recently just passed from cancer and my mother actually lost her life at the age of 48 to cancer. My mom was diagnosed in her early 30s with breast cancer. I'm 30, scary, <laughs> and later lost her life at the age of 48 to ovarian cancer. And what now I wanna get into is what I have. Before I really dive in though, I just want to preface this that I'm clearly not a doctor. So basically, um, if I make an error, I apologize. I'm just going off of this the best that I can with what I have learned. All right, so just to go back to what I was previously saying, I got my test done in 2019. And when I say my tests, I got tested for both the BRCA gene mutations. There is BRCA1 and there is BRCA2. I have a little piece of paper right here just from one of my doctors that I can just actually read the facts, the percentages off of just to give you guys the correct information and tell you the differences between both mutations. So when it comes to both BRCA1 and BRCA2, basically what it means is that you are just at a higher risk of getting breast and ovarian cancer when compared to somebody else who doesn't have the mutation. Now for the facts. For BRCA1, um, your chances of getting breast cancer are increased by 55 to 65% when compared to somebody without the mutation, they're at a 9% chance. So significantly increased. And um, when you have the BRCA2, you are at a 45 to 47% risk increase um, when compared to that 9%. And then when it comes to ovarian, if you have BRCA1, you are at a 39% risk higher percentage when compared to a 1% without the mutation. And for BRCA2, you are uh, bumped up to an 11 to 17% risk higher increase when compared to that same 1%. So if you haven't figured it out, BRCA1 kind of seems to be the more unfortunate one to have. I should also mention that these percentages fluctuate as you grow older with age. And when I mean fluctuate, they increase. <laughs> this actually isn't just exclusive to women either. Obviously our ovaries are, but males can also get breast cancer. And if you have the BRCA1 gene mutation as a male, you are at a 1% risk higher. And um, unfortunately BRCA2 is worse for males and you are at a 7% higher risk um, when compared to Someone without the mutation, it is a 0.06% chance. So what does this mean? What should you do with this information? I will just tell you what I've been doing. I have a team of doctors. I have an oncologist who is the person who kind of just led me to find all these other amazing doctors. I've been able to bounce ideas off of everybody and just collect all of the data for myself to kind of make decisions but you should be doing self breast exams. You should be increasing your breast screenings. So I have actually been getting a mammogram every year and then an MRI every year. It switches every six months, which one I get. So that's just for your boobies, but what about your ovaries? Um, you wanna be getting transvaginal ultrasounds. 
and um, also there's a lot of blood work that they'll have you do as well just to be keeping up with all of that see if anything fluctuates as a 30 year old woman this is what has been presented to me by all of my doctors they are recommending a double mastectomy as soon as possible so that is the removal of your breasts and I have also learned that I should be looking at getting a vasectomy where they just, you know, take out all of my lady parts by the time I'm 35. That number can kind of fluctuate a little bit. I've heard like 40s um, by some of my doctors, but by the doctor that I actually trust the most, um, he told me 35. Obviously, so much decision making goes into all of this. I've actually decided to go through with the double mastectomy. I am making this video on Saturday, April 24th, and I will be getting my surgery in four days on the 28th of April. Of course, a lot of discussions with my doctors and research had to go into my decision making. A little bit about me, if you are watching this and you don't really know anything about me, you've never watched my other videos, I have been in a long-term relationship with my boyfriend. We just celebrated our four-year anniversary on the 20th of this month, so a few days ago. And to just be fully transparent, um, we don't have a child together. It's something that we have discussed. Personally, neither of us are ready as of right now. And my main priority is just living. <laughs> I've always thought that I would have a kid um, and it's still not 100% something that I'm against, but just as of right now, it's just not in my cards. And as my boyfriend has put it before, it's just like, okay, so, you know, we wanna have a kid eventually. I want you to be around to be in that kid's life. Let's say we go the route of having a kid. <laughs> We're both kind of leaning towards not, if I'm being completely honest. There's always adoption, but why I bring that up is obviously because if um, you go through with a double mastectomy, you're not gonna be able to breastfeed. And of course, if I go through with the vasectomy, that's gonna be maybe another video in the future. I haven't thought all the way there yet. Um, I'm just trying to do one thing at a time here, but um, you can't have a baby if you don't have your lady parts. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody is different and you have to make a decision that is right for you. I've never been opposed to adoption either. I kind of always thought that might be in my cards. So who knows, I'm optimistic for the future. But I just knew that this is something that I had to do. It was right for me. I've come to the conclusion that I just do not want to sit around and play the waiting game. I believe that knowledge is power and I'm so grateful to have the knowledge that I now have. So grateful for today's technology to be able to even know that I have this and I really just feel like it allows me to have some control of my life, some control of this situation. I'll be completely honest, when I first heard the news, um, of course I was taking it serious and I was meeting with my oncologist, but I just really didn't get the clarity that I needed, um, unfortunately, from that doctor. I just thought, you know, I can continue to do my screenings. I have these MRIs and these mammograms that I'm getting. Of course, like they'll catch it soon if I have it and, breast cancer is a pretty easy one to catch quickly. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, even if I get it, you know, they'll be able to catch it quick. But further discussion with other doctors, I have just found out a lot of things that I didn't know before. The one piece of information that I received that actually led me to my decision of going forward with the double mastectomy came from my gynecological oncologist. He's the doctor that I was talking about before, whose opinion I trust the most. He has been in the field for a lot of years and is just very knowledgeable on all of this. The information that he gave me is this. Let's say that I didn't go through with the double mastectomy and I then later in life developed breast cancer. Those cancerous cells have already been introduced into my body. So when it comes time to get my hysterect... I said vasectomy before, it's hysterectomy, oh my God. <laughs> The male version is uh, the vasectomy. Forgive me for that mistake before, hysterectomy. With my inevitable hysterectomy down the line, I will not be able to receive estrogen. And estrogen plays a big role um, after you've had the hysterectomy because, you know, it just keeps you from going into early stages of menopause. I obviously don't wanna go into menopause in my 30s, so that's important to me. And the way that he put it is that it would just really improve my quality of life you know, if he's able to give me the estrogen, which he legally cannot if I had cancerous cells previously in my body. As far as my understanding goes, it's thought of that estrogen basically perpetuates cancer. So if you already have cancer, you can't have it. So learning that just really gave me a whole new perspective and outlook on everything. And I just wanna have, you know, a good quality of life. 
Interestingly enough, that doctor who I keep talking about actually has a theory um, with a few of his colleagues, and they believe that um, early on in life, your fallopian tubes are actually pushing out precancerous cells. According to him, the transvaginal ultrasounds actually aren't the most reliable, and a lot of the time it misses cancer. He feels very strongly about this, so strongly that he would actually have women, if they were willing to, as early as like their early 20s to get their hysterectomies done then. Obviously he's not naive to the fact that most women aren't ready to make that decision then, um, but that's just how serious it is and how early the cancer could be forming. So that really scares me and that's why I'm actually leaning towards doing it soon. In my mind, it's just a little bit foolish to play the waiting game, like I said, because you know, I just, I don't want to end up getting it and then I now have introduced those cancerous cells into my body that could potentially affect me getting other cancers in the future. Seeing what it did to my mom firsthand was just a major learning lesson for me as well. My gynecological oncologist is just an angel sent from heaven. So he is just very blunt and very realistic about this. And when it comes to getting my double mastectomy, um, he's all for it. His opinion is to do something that is called nipple sparing. So you can either, you know, just get rid of your boobs completely and have nothing there. Some women, you know, who have been fighting the battle with actual breast cancer for so long, I can understand why you just come to peace with it and you just don't care about having boobs. I don't know. I can't relate to that. But for me personally, I wanted to do something where I could have boobs still. As a young female, I just would like to have breasts. So that's why I am personally going the reconstructive route. Now, when I mentioned nipple sparing, you can either save your nipples, you're sparing your nips, or you can get rid of them. Now, according to my gynecological oncologist, he basically told me straight up that there really isn't too much of a difference in percentages. I think it might be a 2% higher risk if you keep your nipples versus removing your nipples. And in his mind, he just doesn't view it as being so significant that it makes too much of a difference. Now my general surgeon on the other hand told me straight up that if it was his daughter he would recommend her to completely just remove the nipple. I get both sides and I also appreciated both of them saying it's obviously my decision and they understand that if it's going to be like you know a body image thing where it's like a psychological thing that I'm just going to be depressed that I have no nipples then you know go for it do it keep your nipples. <laughs> Cosmetically it's definitely going to look a little bit more presentable. I obviously have a reconstructive surgeon who went through, you know, what each looked like. I would definitely have pretty big scarring if I didn't keep my nipples. Technology is so great nowadays though that they can actually like tattoo a very realistic nipple on you, <laughs> which is really cool if you decide to go that route. Depending on your own personal breasts, if you have enough tissue left over, they can actually form a little nipple out of existing skin. Unfortunately, with my situation, that's just, it wouldn't be the best for me. <laughs> I'd basically have a very long line scar across like my entire boob. And there really wouldn't be much to work with to create that nipple. So basically to just wrap that up, I chose the nipple sparing. And with those, you are either gonna have a scar underneath your boob or it's gonna be on the side of your boob, kind of like by your nipple. My reconstructive surgeon also gave me the information that it is the most safest and the most natural looking outcome if you go back under the knife a second time. Um, so basically the first Surgery is going to be the removal of all of my breast tissue and all of the cells and everything behind my nipple. They are also going to be putting a skin graft in which will kind of work as a built-in bra. <laughs> From my knowledge, that's somebody else's skin, but they take off any cells, so you're not gonna be getting any kind of cancerous cells from somebody else. I know it's strange, but like I'm just going off of the information that I think I have up here. <laughs> so after my general surgeon does all of the removal, that is when my reconstructive surgeon comes in and he's actually going to be putting in expanders, which um, will be filled with saline. And this just seems to be the best thing in my mind because my boobs will have gone through a brutal beating after this and I don't want to just go straight into putting in implants right away. I wanna give my skin time to stretch 
and that's what the expanders do. So after the first surgery date, um, they will be filled with a little bit of saline, and then I'm gonna meet with my reconstructive surgeon every two weeks to fill it up. And what's also cool about doing it this way, I actually get to have a little bit of say in what the outcome is because I am going to be filling them up to a desired size for me. And that's also what's great about not just going straight to the implant right away because you might put them in and then realize, oh no, I actually don't like them in the end. On the flip side though, the unfortunate part is that I'm going to have to go under the knife a second time to put the eventual implants in. So two surgeries for moi. The recovery time is about four to six weeks. Um, I think that's kind of just for the first surgery, so I heard that it's not as intense the second round. But yeah, just a lot. <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of friends and family who are obviously so concerned and just very supportive of the whole thing and just want to check in and see how I'm feeling about everything, but it's kind of just an odd thing. It's like, I'm doing this, I, I guess I kind of forgot to mention in the beginning that like I could go my whole life and never even get cancer. So um, this is a preventative surgery. There is just absolutely no guarantee, even by me doing the double mastectomy, there's no guarantee that I will not get breast cancer. So there's never a 0% chance. My general surgeon actually told me a story of a woman who got the double mastectomy, did not do nipple sparing, and then also developed breast cancer because there was some tissue, um, I think more on the side because there can be breast tissue over there that it ended up developing in. The unfortunate part of a double mastectomy is that you have no feeling in your boobs. <laughs> My reconstructive surgeon actually said that he's had cases of women that will actually still feel a little bit of sensation in their nipples though, and that they'll be reactive, um, you know, just to like cold weather and things like that. So that's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanna make that very apparent because this isn't just a normal boob job. I will no longer have feeling for the most part, I'm assuming. But when asked how I'm feeling, it just is what it is in my eyes and I'm just gonna go into it with positive vibes. That's just who I am. I'm a very go with the flow kind of person. What will be, will be. I'm not gonna stress. <laughs> I've never had any surgery in my life. I've broken a ton of bones. I've had a spinal tap before, so painful, but I've never had to go under anesthesia even. Even when I had my wisdom teeth removed, I just like took a pill and I'm awake the whole time just chilling. <laughs> so this is a big deal. I am so blessed to have such an incredible man in my life. My partner, Jarrett, he has just been with me every step of the way. God, I don't wanna get emotional. <laughs> I'm just so lucky to have someone who accepts me, oh my God, for all that I am and uh, just so supportive of my decisions and will love me no matter what. So that's really nice. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know that's not the case for everybody out there and I feel for anybody. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you have to do what's right for you. And you know, he's great because he allows me to make those decisions obviously for myself. He's supportive of whatever I choose. And I just, at the end of the day, that's all that I can give advice on and recommend is to just do what is best for you. It's your life. You got to do what keeps you sane, what puts your mind at ease and what makes you feel the best. So I kind of think that's all that I wanted to talk about. Um, I hope I'm not missing anything, but like I said, I might make future videos because I still have a lot of decisions to make down the line. Any women or men out there that are dealing with the same thing, I want you to feel like this is a safe space. If you have any questions, um, if you just wanna chat about this, I'm here for you. It's definitely heavy stuff, but uh, you're not alone. I hope that this could possibly give you some clarity, answer some questions that you may have had, and maybe even give you a little bit of hope because that's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling optimistic and hopeful for the future. So thank you guys if you made it this far. I appreciate you sticking it out. It's very important. Like I said at the beginning of this video, go get tested. Um, you can demand these exams even if you don't have a family history. If you just wanna know for your own peace of mind, I think that my genetic panel, um, I don't know if I mentioned that before, but yeah, I think it's also important to just get a full on genetic panel to ease your mind completely of any other mutations that you may have. Thankfully for myself, I only have the BRCA1 gene mutation, nothing else to have to worry about. But that genetic panel was probably like 90 something dollars, so not that bad. Worth it for the one-time payment to have knowledge for life. Any who's, uh, I guess I will see you guys in my next video. Maybe it'll be a little bit more of a happy one, but thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. Hope you're staying safe and healthy. Bye y'all.